Welcome back, everybody. It is time for Silver and Black today, the, the Thursday edition. I almost said Tuesday. Yes, I don't know what day of the week it is, but welcome back anyway. <laughs> this is Silver and Black today. We are an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Hey, it's the off season. It's the, the slowest part of the year, so my, my brain is following suit. But thank you guys for being with us. If you don't already subscribe to the show where you get your audio, please do so. Just search Silver and Black today wherever you get it. Spotify, Apple, Google, we're there. You can find us and uh, put on that auto download for us. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you for the subscription, the thumbs up, and don't forget, hit that notifications bell. We're going to jump right in today. Of course, I am Scott Colbranson, your host, along with my co-host. That is Mr. Mo Moten. He's senior NFL writer over at Bleach Report, also Raiders columnist at sportsnotnaut.com where you can see his work on the Raiders. You can also see my work up there on various things, mostly video these days. But anyway, that's where you can find us. You can follow me on X, L V Gully, and the show is SNB today. Mo, hey, listen, a lot of folks upset. The ESPN folks gave the Raiders offseason a D. Uh, and um, I'll go through that in a minute. But, you know, folks get upset. Raider Nation, very excited about the new season, the new coach, the new mentality around the Raiders since Antonio Pierce took over. But I want to read a couple of these things because some of it I actually agree with, some of it I don't. But we'll, we'll, I want to get your reaction to this because uh gave the Raiders a D and it said the biggest move that the Raiders made, biggest move that the Raiders ra- made was the one they didn't make, which was their failure to acquire a long-term solution at quarterback. I kind of agree, but but I'll get to there in a second. Uh, move that the writer liked was the re-signing of Andre James, which is interesting because it's a good signing, but did he not hear about Christian Wilkins? Uh, anyway, uh, move he disliked was not trading Devontae Adams, which we'll get into as well. He says here, uh, the Raiders demonstrated the follies of, of a move not made this offseason. First, they failed to secure a long-term solution at quarterback. And um, they also had paid a non-trivial $15 million to Gardner Minshew, even though he was coming off a season. So there's a little backhanded compliments there. And we'll get into some of the rest of this. But, Mo, what's your, what's your point of view on this? Look, I know Raider fans are used to and they believe that the national media is not uh, a very receptive to the Raiders actually trying to be a good team. And so they kind of dismiss it, but it also makes them a little angry. Uh, but we've talked about the national media who doesn't follow the team every day, doesn't have the best perspective anyway. But when you look at this, and I know you read it, uh, what's what's your thoughts here on on giving them a D and sort of what the writer liked about it, what he didn't like about it, and then their biggest move being the non-move? I think the biggest reason why the Seth Walder was the writer over Yes, it. thank you. And the reason he gave him a D, in my opinion, is because I, I believe he feels like the Raiders – don't know who they are between mm. a contender and a pretender. And I think he sees the Raiders as a pretender and they should have been selling instead of acquiring high price players such as Christian Wilkins. So the writer didn't love the Christian Wilkins pickup. And I think that goes to his point about why didn't the Raiders trade Devontae Adams? He feels the Raiders should have been sellers coming into this year and going into a rebuild year. It's kind of very similar to how the people feel about the Tennessee Titans, right? So the Tennessee Titans did not resign Ryan Tannehill. They have Will Levis as their presumptive starting quarterback. And a lot of people are saying, why are the Tennessee Titans signing Calvin Ridley and trading for Legereus Sneed from from the Kansas City Chiefs? This is a team that's not going to win more than eight games. Why are they making these win-now moves? And I think Seth Walker has the same perspective as the Raiders as, why are they making these win-now moves when they should be rebuilding? Right. So, yes. Yeah. And, and we've talked about that many times here on this show is as, as, as excited as fans are for this new era of Raiders football, uh, outside folks are looking at the Raiders as sort of what we've talked about in the past being in that purgatory. Are they really going to be a winning team? Are they going to be a, a teeter totter one minute? They look like they could get in the playoffs the next minute. They can't. So when you're in that purgatory, so to speak, um, you're not going to get a lot of people that believe in you. Now, a lot of fans, a lot of folks, prognosticators will say, oh, good, let them underestimate them. But I do think, and, and I don't necessarily, well, I shouldn't say this. I, I think that the biggest move they didn't make is the one he let, lets down as the biggest move overall. And I can't disagree with that because I'm not saying they should have because of where they were. 
they tried, we know, in some way to get up in the draft to get a quarterback. But I do think that until you have a long-term solution at quarterback, it's always going to be a question mark unless Aiden O'Connell becomes something that we don't necessarily think he can be, which is a top five, top eight uh, franchise quarterback. Now, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. Who knows? But that move is, itself, I think, is true. And again, a lot of people disagree with us, our, our listeners, our viewers sometimes, when we talk about the importance of quarterback and they try to point out all these other things about guys drafted way long time ago. And But Mo, I think this goes back to, if you look at the NFL in the last five to seven years, you got to have that quarterback. It's the reason why the Raiders aren't getting a lot of national love. And I don't know if fans listening to us right now really care for it or not, mm -hmm. but this is when you don't, when you have a quarterback question, you don't have that potential franchise player under center. You're just not going to get a lot of love. You're not going to get a lot of nationally televised standalone games. Where just didn't. You're not going to get teams projecting you no books projecting you to to win more than eight games. I believe DraftKings has the Raiders at six and a half wins. I still take the over on that, but six and a half mm -hmm. wins, is six and a half wins. That's the line. And you have Seth Walder who wrote this piece, who basically is saying, you know, the Raiders don't know who they are right now. This is a team that should be rebuilding and they're keeping 30 plus year old Devontae Adams and they're making these big splashy signings when they should be, again, selling assets instead of acquiring them. So now it's the it's up to the Raiders to prove Seth Walder, Draft Kings, and whoever doesn't think they're going to win 10 wins wrong and say, see, Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew turned into a serviceable quarterback. We needed Devontae Adams. Our defense is top 10 in the league and got better with Christian Wilkins and exactly. we are a playoff contender. But that's up to the Raiders, because right now from the outside looking in, if I told you if this wasn't a Raider team, if I just put a blank team on the screen and said this team doesn't know who their week one starter is going to be, right? They have a new offensive coordinator who's who has a lot to prove. What would you say about that football team? Would you say that football team is a playoff team? You probably go, eh, probably mediocre. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look at in their own division with the Broncos and the Chargers. Right. That's what they say about the Chargers and the Broncos. Now, I think fans have a point there because I think those teams have big questions to answer, too. But at least one of them, the L.A. team, they have a quarterback. They have a big name head coach who's proven himself in the NFL. So that's why they get love, even though I think the roster overall was depleted a little bit. But they have the quarterback, whether you like him or not, they have the quarterback and they have the coach. That's a known commodity. Not saying that Antonio Pierce can't be incredibly successful because I think he can. But. That's why, from a national perspective, remember, they have to appeal to everybody, not just Raider fans. So I'm with you there, Amo. Before we head to the break and get to your calls, also, we talking about Devontae Adams as part of this because that's one of the things he said was they should have traded him. And we talked about this on the last show, and boy, did we get a heavy reaction from people who didn't even listen or read <laughs> in, the, in the post on X for the show that we disagreed with trading him now. And so um, it – you. I think Raider fans overall, Raider Nation, they have had so many great players come through the Raiders and then them leave or have them leave and become good players that they can't imagine it happening again with a guy they were so excited to get. And like you and I agreed, I don't think they trade them unless the season doesn't progress like they think it can and they get to the trade deadline and they're not going anywhere. And then you're faced with the specter of, okay, you're going to bring this guy back and you really have to rebuild that offense. And if you do, is he going to be around? So, so I think that people need to, to, and I agree with them. I wouldn't trade him now either, but down the line, if the Raiders don't do well, I think it's going to be a reality. So a couple of things here, Scott, I, I, I think people heard what we said that we don't agree with trading Devontae Adams. Mm -hmm. I think, Fans are just tired of hearing about the Devontae Adams trade chat. Yes. So I've been I've been fighting back against this for maybe a year now because remember the Devontae Adams Jets chatter was going around. <laughs> I said it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Devontae Adams wants to be close to his family. He's not gonna want to go to New York. And I know he doesn't have a no trade clause, but he could say, Look, if you trade me to New York, he could tell the Jets, I'm not playing in New York City. Right. If if, if I if they move me here, I, I'm not interested in playing here. And they yeah. would acquire him. You don't want a disgruntled player at that point. So it fans, I think, are tired of hearing it. And I and I don't I, again I don't talk about it unless it's a big talking point. And it came up in this ESPN article. It's come up um with the non-guaranteed years that I talked about last week's um and Tuesday show about Devontae doesn't have the last two years of his contract are non-guaranteed, which makes his contract 
you know, easy to move if the Raiders wanted to move on or if he wanted to move on. Because teams love when a player, a high caliber player, has non guaranteed years because then once they acquire that player, they can restructure his contract however they want. Now, once you restructure that contract, they may be a little skittish or hesitant to acquire Devontae at his age with high guaranteed money, which is why I said on Tuesday's show, if the Raiders want to show they want to keep Devontae Adams for the long term, if Devontae Adams wants to be a Raider for the long term, restructure his, con- his contract, give him a, a significant amount of guaranteed money, and the trade chatter will go away. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's the thing, too, is you talked about him not wanting to be away from the West Coast. We talked about the Rams on the last episode. Even if they don't trade for him, which I don't think happens, before training camp, uh, getting into the season, if they're in a nice run and they need a piece, then you see a team like that. I think that's the type of thing for Devontae Adams that's the perfect situation. If it doesn't work out in Vegas, which I still think it can, is, hey, you're a team, you're looking for that extra piece just to get you get you through the playoffs, try to try to contend for the Super Bowl. So you look at the Rams. I'm not saying they're going to contend for the Super Bowl, but if they're if they're doing really well and they want to go deep in the playoffs, you do that. Even the Houston Texans with that young team and that young quarterback, if they have a season like they had last year, and one of the missing missing pieces they have, even though they have Nico Collins and some of these guys who did well, hey, I'm I'm from the Texans and you're the Raiders and I can give you uh, somebody for for uh, Devonte Adams to get us through playoff. Have a veteran on my team. I do it in a second. So we'll see. But um, hopefully that never comes up because the Raiders do well and Minshew or uh, and or AOC do well and they're they're not looking to trade. Like I said, that to me, there's I don't want to say no chance, but a, a trade for Devontae Adams is not happening before the season starts. So Agreed. if you're a Raider fan thinking about it, it's not going to happen. Don't there's worry no about way, it. Yeah. Th- th- yeah, there's no way they go into the season and say we're going to trade our best, as I said, their best offensive player with a quarterback question mark. Correct. Now, again, we may have to revisit revisit this before the trade deadline, depending on what the Raiders' record is. Absolutely. Well said. All right, we're going to hit to the break, and then we come back, we're going to get to your calls and your text messages on the Raider Nation mailbag here on this Thursday, this hot Thursday in June. Very hot. I don't know if it is where you are, but where I'm at and Mo's at, I know it's extremely hot. So we'll be back. Don't go anywhere. We're coming back, and we're going to hear you on Silver and Black today. Mm-hmm. Welcome back, Silver and Black today, the home stretch here. It is time for the Raider Nation mailbag segment of the show during this offseason, the, the worst three weeks of the year for football <laughs> fans because there's absolutely nothing going on. And don't talk to me about UFL championships or any of that kind of stuff. But anyway, so we're back. We're going <laughs> to listen to you. By the way, if you want to get in for the next show, uh, you can dial 702-900-7869, 702 702- 900 7869. You can you can leave a voicemail there. We're increasingly getting more texts, which is fine. You're making me work and read your stuff, but that's cool. I got it. No problem. Uh, but we love to hear your voice too. Always fun. You can call any time of day or night. It just rings through to the to the answering machine. 702 900 7869. Leave your name, your city where you're calling from, and then your question or comment. All right, Mo, without further ado, we're gonna jump right in. We're first gonna go to a call. This is our good buddy Tarek. He's, uh, I guess, at home in Chicago. So here's Tarek. Good evening, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek hollering at you guys from Chicago. Hope you guys are well. Uh, I had not heard of the rumors about Devontae Adams. Uh, Devontae Adams is going to be 32 in December. This guy is an all-world wide receiver. He's a consummate professional. And when he came to Vegas, he came to play with Derek Carr. But what, what he's experienced in Vegas, you guys, <laughs> this is not what he signed up for. This guy is arguably still a top three, top five receiver in the NFL. And he has high expectations that he's not going to lower. I mean, he went from Aaron Rodgers and then came came to play with his boy, Derek Carr. Yeah, that was a one-year uh, reunion, which did not end very well. And now it clearly turns out that Jordan Love is the franchise quarterback in Green Bay. He's already got a playoff win under his belt. But I think, um, I think he's never going to come out and say it, but I think Devontae Adams knows that there is not a bona fide franchise legit starting quarterback on the current Raiders hmm. roster. Um, I think if they don't make any major strides on offense this year and just are really not just are, are not trending in the right direction, I can easily see a situation where he's going to be. I think he's going to be gone after this upcoming season. Um, he's still young enough and productive enough to pick another location where he has a chance at winning a ring, and that's what that guy aspires to do. Probably not going to happen in Vegas, considering we don't have a bona fide franchise quarterback. Uh, let me know what you guys think about that. I hope you have a great week, and I'll talk to you guys again soon. Go Raiders. All right, our boy Tarek. Good call. 
Mo, yeah, I, I would agree with him there that if 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 the Raiders don't have a good season, we talked about the trade deadline, but if he stays and they don't trade him at the deadline, he definitely, if things don't go well, would be an offseason. And I would imagine he might even request it, like Tarek said. Tarek, you're not going to get a lot of support from fans in the chat. They're <laughs> they're right now throwing whatever they have in front of them at, at you, yeah. you, at us, because they can't get to you. But this is what a lot of Raider fans don't want to talk about, simply because they want to believe that the team is not going to face plant under Antonio Pierce. And I don't mm -hmm. think the Raiders will, but let, let's say hypothetically they do. Then the conversation reopens is, okay, is Devontae Adams happy? Does he want to go somewhere else where he contends for a title? Because if the Raiders start to trend in the wrong direction, and he is on the other side of 30 now, you have to think about it. Again, two years of non-guaranteed money in his contract is easily movable. And if he's looking at the Raiders roster and saying, okay, we have Aiden O'Connell, we have Garner Minshew, he didn't perform well. And if the Raiders are picking, I don't know, somewhere between 12 and 16 again, I know it's not a stronger quarterback draft as, as this year is what they're saying. But if he doesn't see a future with a quarterback, then he, you know, he may, it may be a mutual parting of ways between Devontae and the Raiders. I could see it happen, but again, it would have to be a team on the West Coast. So Gary, my colleague over at Bleach Report, brought up the Rams. I think that's, that could be a spot for him uh, on the West Coast, a, a team that, Contending for right now, they got Matthew Stafford there. He may only have two, three more years optimally. But the Rams are in the playoff picture, and they surprise a lot of people. They're young on the defensive side of the ball. But on the offensive side of the ball, you know, they, they got an established guy in Cooper Cup, who I said has been hurt. Cooper Naku is young. Again, Matthew Stafford up there in years, already has a Super Bowl title. If Devontae Adams is saying, okay, how can I maximize the next two, three years of my career, I can see him going to or wanting to go to the Rams. Yep, absolutely. Tarek, thanks for the call. All right, we're going to do a text now. Uh, this is, uh, it says, what up, what up, guys? This is um, Javi from Bay from the Bay Area. Love the show and how you guys keep it real. The question I have is, what do we want to see from this offense? I think we can win seven games with this defense, but it all depends on Getze. I want to see different formations and how he uses our weapons. Also, Getze needs to get the best play out of our quarterback, whomever it is. I'm a big believer that a great coach puts players in the best position to succeed. Thank you. Side note, I took over the over six and a half. That's Javi up in uh, the Bay Area. I agree 100% with him. I, I, he brought up all the question marks that we've been talking about for several weeks here, Mo. Yeah, absolutely. And I think any any fan that's looking at this from a more objective perspective, as we try to do on this show, <laughs> can see the <laughs> obvious question marks. Quarter, start You start with the quarterback position. I had a piece on sports, not, uh, although I'm not worried about this. The health of the left side of the offensive line is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. Colton, Miller's, Colton Miller's coming off of shoulder surgery. And Jackson Powers Johnson missed a big chunk of OTA spring practices because he had an injury. So those two guys have to come back healthy because that's the left side. of That's the entire left side of your, of your offensive line. The other question mark being the cornerback position. If, they're, if the opposing quarterback is not going to throw at Jack Jones, they're going to corner or target an area of the defense. It's going to be the other side of the boundary. Whoever that starting quarterback is going to be, you would hope that Jacory and Bennett is able to make a second-year leap or that Brandon Faison is at least serviceable if the two rookies, Dekamian Richardson and MJ Devonshire, don't start opposite Jack Jones. Yeah, and the, and the Raiders um... – face some really good quarterbacks this year so it's going to be it's going to be tough now they've they've done pretty well against justin herbert in the division um and obviously they did well against mahomes on christmas but still a big task so good point all right javi thanks for the uh, the uh text next we go to our buddy murph here's our buddy murph hi scott and mo this is murph <laughs> second time long time hey guys just wanted to call and say hey and tell you uh, first and foremost how much I appreciate the kind words around Raiders fan radio and, uh, and the kind words that you have for, for myself and my co-hosts uh, on your show. Uh, always very uh, kind of you guys uh, to, to, to talk about us in that way. But hey, I just wanted to say, you know, you guys were having a discussion around uh, being objective and not having emotional takes. And man, I, that's why I like your show. And I, that's why, frankly, you're the only podcast about the Raiders I listen to. Um, because I've always said that I don't want to listen to other people's stuff that we don't support other uh, podcasts and especially the fan created ones. But it's it's I never wanted someone else's opinion to be my opinion when, mm. for when we go live on our show. But I love listening to you guys because 
Your guys' opinion won't be mine because you're rational. It's my job to be a rational Raider fan. It's your job to tell me that the cornerback room is only a four. I got him at like a nine and a half. Oh. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, so I just wanted to tell you how much we appreciate you guys. Love you guys. And uh, keep, keep up the awesome work. And thank you for the support for the show and the One Nation Foundation. But then, hey, I can't just call and, and pontificate about podcasting and making shows. <laughs> I got to ask you a question about something that I haven't heard you guys talk about yet. And that is, a, and I would pose this question to a lot of or comment to a lot of Raider fans out there. A lot of us are thinking that the Raiders are going to make a move for some veteran players. Stephon Gilmore has been bandied about amongst uh, quite a few others. But these guys don't want to be a training camp. That's the thing that I think a lot of times that folks aren't taking into account is that these guys don't want to go into, go into camp. They're not going to get signed in June. These guys are going to get signed in late July, maybe even late August. Like, they don't want to go through the rigors of training camp just to figure out they got to compete with a position. So, anyways, give me your thoughts on that. I uh, just want to hear what, what y'all think. Love you. Take care. Go Raiders. <laughs> our buddy Murph from Raider Fan Radio, such a good dude. You can catch him on our post-game shows, actually, from last to the last two years. And I was down there in Nashville. Such good folks. Him and Michelle and Swag Jeff, of course. So thanks for calling in, man. I, I certainly appreciate it. Mo, I'm going to let you take this one because I know we're of like mind on this. It's it's always a good time when when Swag Jeff or or Murph call in. We now we need Michelle to call in to get the full trifecta. <laughs> Michelle, if you're out there and you're listening, please call into the show because we got go. Swag Jeff, we got Murph. We we need the trifecta. But I actually mentioned this on the on a previous show that Stefan Gilmore is waiting for the the right. He said the right situation, and I and I think I said this too that the more established players don't want to run around in the heat. Especially, mm-hmm. I mean, I know they're going to Costa Mesa, which, which is cooler than where they were in Vegas. But a lot of these older players who are established don't want to be running around and competing for a job in the heat. They, as Murph said, they're going to sign, you know, right before training camp or maybe right before the first preseason game because they're not going to play in the preseason games anyway. They're going to check in midsummer. So I, I would just hold tight. I, I would still keep my eye on Adoree Jackson as a veteran. The Raiders probably may may have on speed dial. I'm not reporting this, but I would I would assume that they're, if they want some cornerback veteran insurance, he would be on that short list because outside of Stephon Gilmore, I think he's the best option. Now, also just keep in mind that players are often traded uh, between training camp, the first week of training camp, and week one of the, of the season. So you're going to see moves made, guys made available. Certain good players on all the rosters aren't going to make the 50-man depth charts. The teams will cut them early out of respect to give that veteran a chance to catch on right. somewhere else. So just be patient with the cornerback position. But I, I do think they want to legitimately give Ja'Korian Bennett or one of the rookies a chance to at least earn the job over Brendan Faison. Yeah, there's no hurry. As Murph said, you know, these guys, like and you just pointed out, they don't want to run around in the heat, especially in Las Vegas, uh, where it's 115 and all that jazz. So so I wouldn't get nervous. If you're a fan and you're waiting for them to sign somebody, if they don't sign somebody and you're hearing great reports from these young kids coming out of camp as far as Ja'Cory and Bennett's doing really well and they're getting people to play, then don't worry about it. And then if they haven't signed anybody yet and you're hearing that they're they're not doing well, they will. I think we see it every year, like you pointed out so many times, Mo. You see it every year in training camp. Teams go in, they start going hard, and then they go, "Uh uh-oh, we're not going to be able to make that. we got to go get some help. So we'll see how it all works out. But Murph, as always, my friend, thank you for the call, and thanks for all the work you guys all do on the One Nation Foundation. All right, our next is a text. This is from Dennis McDonald in uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. I think this is our first Alaska uh, outside of our good friend Ed Marshall. He says he's a Raider fan since 1973, follows us on Twitter, and appreciates your unbiased views on the Raiders. Scott, glad you clarified your Chargers fan history because I almost (laughs) fell off my treadmill listening at first. (laughs) (laughs) That's a funny one. Uh, Looking at the AFC West, where teams have six games in division and the AFC West has the North, which is tough, which might be the toughest division in football, actually. Then looking at some of the other out-of-conference games and potential cold-weather December games, it looks like our division won't have a 12-win squad. I could see Denver struggling to get any wins. KC are champs, but their schedule is rough. Does it feel like the AFC West could likely be won with 10 wins this year? Also, a former Raiders to have on the show, because we asked you guys, who would you like to hear? 
was he said it would be cool to get Phil Vilpiano on. And Phil's been on the show several times, many times over the years. Probably not in the last two seasons, but he's been on the show a bunch. So we will try to get him on as well. He's so much fun. Uh, he has a lot of history and likely some great stories of Raiders past. Yes, I've heard some on the air and some better ones off the air, which we can't put on the air. So, but good stuff. And Dennis in Anchorage, Alaska. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I get looking at the schedule. I don't think 10 wins ever wins the AFC West. I just don't. I think you can talk about the Chiefs' schedule being tough, but it was last year too, right? And they repeated as Super Bowl champions. And so I, I think 12 wins is well within reach of the Chiefs despite the schedule. And I think they've gotten a little better. So, Mo, what's your, what's your view on his question around the division and what it might take to win it? Two takes. One, the Chiefs have won a division, I believe, eight straight years. So they've had the toughest, they've had a tough schedule for about eight straight years. So I, yeah. the tough schedule thing is not is not a big deal for the Chiefs. What I will say though is that they're they are going for their third consecutive Super Bowl win, and that is tough. Yes. And I think we're gonna see a lot of their older players, Travis Kelsey, maybe take a week off or two. Not to say that he's gonna loaf it around, but they may sit a player here or two just to prepare for a deep playoff run. Actually, I can actually see the Chiefs, you know, winning 10 games and being the division leader simply because they could be preserving players for the playoffs. Mm. So they may say, look, we, we've we gone on the road and won the Super Bowl already. We don't need to win the division with 13, 12 wins. As long as we get into the playoffs, as long as we get into the dance, we're fine. The only thing I will say is, I, I actually, if I had to make a prediction, I would say, and I, and I think in my win-loss predictions, I had the Chiefs winning 11 games. I think they're going to win 11 games like they won last year because you don't want to flirt with 10 wins because if you if you flirt with 10 wins, you may not make the playoffs in the AFC. Let's remember Joe Burrow's on the way back. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers is now on the field for the Jets. So 10 wins doesn't guarantee you no. a playoff spot. So if you're the Chiefs, even though you may take a week off here and there, I think you feel safer at 11 wins versus 10 because if you if you don't win a division at, at 10 wins and you're looking at a wild card spot, then you have to fall on hoping that you win a tiebreaker. And if you're the Chiefs, you don't want that. So I think 11 wins wins the AFC West this upcoming season with the Chiefs. Right, and if you you if you if you win the AFC West with 10 wins, um, boy, I'll tell you, like it, it, like you said, the AFC is going to be hard all the way around. I mean, you look at Pittsburgh. I know some of you guys want to crap on Russell Wilson, and you have Justin Fields there too. They're going to be better. I just think they're going to be better. I think Cleveland's going to be better than they were even though they made the playoffs with, with Joe Flacco last year. And then you talked about the Bengals. So so that division, you got the Bills, you got the Ravens. It's a tough, a tough road in the AFC. And so I, I don't – I mean, look, the Chiefs won 11 games last year. And they were five and four at home. That was unheard of for them to be near 500 at home. I don't think that happens. Now they might lose a couple more on the road. They were six and two on the road last year. So we'll see how it all goes. But I, I agree with you, Mo. I don't think 10 wins gets close. And last year, you only had one team over nine wins in, in the AFC West. And that was the Chief with 11, the Raiders with eight, and the Broncos with eight. So uh, it'll be interesting. But we certainly appreciate you listening all the way up there in Anchorage. Alaska. So thank you for that. Send salmon. We're happy. Um, but we appreciate it. All right. That's going to close out the show today. I know it was a quick one, but uh, it is the off season and we're going to be back next week. We're going to talk about some interesting stuff. Make sure you follow us on x.com. SNB today is the show. Mo is M O E M O T O N. That's Mo Moten. I am at LV Gully. We might ask you some questions and you can always find out what's coming up on the show there as well. Mo, anything you want to give people a heads up on what you're up to? Well, I do have an, an article coming out. Uh, people probably don't want to read it because it's uh, it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be head coaching and quarterback tandems, the best head coaching and quarterback tandems in the league. Ah. Of course, the Raiders uh, just hired Antonio Pierce, and they don't know who their quarterback is, so the Raiders can't, can't make the list because they don't really have a set tandem yet. But if you want to check that out and just look around the league, and just get familiar with you know some of the success around around the league and what it looks like for a quarterback head coach. Check out that piece on Ble that piece on Bleach Report, excuse me. And again, I'm not gonna have a Bleach Report live until late July, right before training camp. So I'm on, not on a break, but on a bit of a video hiatus. But you can still catch me here with Scott over here at Silver and Black today. There you go. All right. Well, we're gonna be back next week. So make sure you do that. Also, again, make sure you subscribe. Even if you're watching us on YouTube or you're watching us on X or you're watching us on Facebook. 
just go wherever you get your podcast, subscribe to it. I don't care if you haven't listened to it because you listen to it on YouTube instead. Fine. That's fine. Just go ahead and sign up for the subscription anyway. That helps us out significantly. So we'd appreciate it. You can get it wherever you get your audio. Thanks to the YouTube audience, as always, and the Rumble audience and the Facebook audience, everywhere where the videos go on Twitch. We've got a couple folks on Twitch who watch us on the gaming channel. Yes, they do. They're like, who's this old dude? But anyway, that's uh, where you can find us. And we certainly appreciate that and all the comments and all the chatter. It's such great chat inside on the videos. So we appreciate that. Mo, my friend, I will see you next week. See you next week. All right. For our producer, Mike Rabier, our, our ace over at Odyssey, we appreciate his help. For Mo Moten, I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black today. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>